Welcome back, everyone. So in today's lecture, we're going to discuss suicidal behavior across the lifespan. So why is this an important topic? Well, I'd say for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first, the primary one, is because suicidal behavior, believe it or not, uh, is drastically different across the lifespan. So part of the reason why I gave you a couple of readings on late life suicide is because suicide among older adults does seem to be a different beast than it is for younger adults. Uh, you have somewhat different risk factors, protective factors, certainly different rates. Um, and people seem to know the risk factors and protective factors better for younger adults than for older adults. So I want to give you those readings. Now, one thing that the readings really don't do justice um, and I haven't found a great reading for, is discussing the differences truly across the lifespan um, of suicide pre prevalences and some of the main differences you see in suicidal behavior. So the purpose of this lecture is to get into those issues. I uh, talked about prevalence, talked about the main differences between the age groups, and then the readings will be a nice supplement to that, with um, especially for older adults, but also you have the teen suicide book to talk about adolescence as well. But looking at the important factors um, for suicide within that age group. So just to give a brief outline, we're going to talk about suicidal behavior among children. Then I lumped together adolescents and young adults because they do have a lot of similarities. Uh, we'll go to middle adulthood, which is a really important area for suicide right now. And then suicide in late life. So suicidal behavior in children. Um, I think people think suicide occurs in children more than it does. And part of the reason why it doesn't occur very much is, as we've discussed in previous lectures, you have to have suicide intent. You have to have a um, intention of dying in the suicide act in order for it to be classified as a suicide. And for young children, that's very unlikely. Um, so that's why it's much more likely to see death by accident or illness for young children. Now that being said, even though it's not that common, we see that um, for those ages 10 to 14, for instance, suicide was the third leading cause of death for these children. So on one hand, that sounds high, and you know, it is. It, that's one of the leading causes of death. It's something we need to be aware of. But when you look at the actual rates, you know, since, well, first of all, zero to five years old um, in 2010, and this has been consistent for several years that I've looked at, there weren't any suicides reported nationwide. So um, below five, it seems like suicide just does not happen. But six to 10, you do get occasional cases, but we're talking about 14 in a year across the entire United States. So you can see, compared to the national rate of 12.4 per 100,000, this is infinitely small. It's very, very small. Um, and then when we get to 11 to 15, so those early teen years where we start thinking about suicide risk, there is risk, and it's good that we're aware of it um, because it is one of the leading causes of death for children. But even with that, we see a rate that is six times lower than the national average. So it's good to be aware of suicide risk in children. Just like it's good to be aware of suicide risk with any age group, but what we see is that it's very, very rare in children, and um, you have higher rates um, later in the lifespan. So adolescents, we start seeing an uptick um, in suicide rate, uh, especially once we get more to the young adult ages. So what we see here is that suicide is the third leading cause of death uh, for those 15 to 24, and the second leading cause of death for those 25 to 34. So if you look within those age groups at what actually causes someone to die, um, it looks really prevalent. And we hear a lot about uh, teens and adolescent suicide, and I think because of that, 
we may think it's more prevalent than it really is. It's that availability heuristic that I've spoken about before, which is where you hear about it, you know, certainly you, you hear about someone in a high school that dies by suicide, and you think it's more prevalent than it actually is. And I mention this in no way to minimize teen or adolescent suicide, but to help you become aware of how big of a problem it is later in the lifespan um, at the ages that's not talked about as much um, because I think that can often get ignored. So from 16 to 20 years, so this is you know the late high school years, early college years, we see you know the rate has risen quite a bit but still actually below the overall average rate for the United States. So still, even though the rate is significantly higher than it was in childhood, it's actually lower risk than the overall average American. Now where we start to see that change is as we get into early adulthood and um, I'd call even up to 34, early adult, young adult, um, Maybe it's because as I get older, I like to shift that back further and further. But um, what we see is now we're starting to see some rates that are above that U.S. average. So we do see an increase as we get into the young adult years in the suicide rate. Um, and what one thing that's of note with this is um, a lot of attention gets paid to college student suicide and I think that's good it's um, fitting because suicide is an issue in college campuses um, I certainly know this I head up a um, suicide prevention grant here at state so we have money from the federal government from SAMHSA to help prevent college suicide I'm very thankful for that because there's a huge need for it but one thing that I think often gets forgotten and isn't talked about much is the suicide rate for those who are not in college at this age group is actually higher than those who are in college. So we have a lot of resources and attention being paid to those who go to college. And again, I think that's fitting. But don't forget those who go straight into the workforce or who are struggling to find work um, because we do know that the risk is a little higher with the, that group. <clears throat> now with adolescence, um, bouncing back to adolescence, you know, one of the reasons I think that there's so much focus on suicide, suicide behavior despite the rate being a little lower than the national average is because of the attempts you see a lot of suicide attempts in this age group. And what we see down here is for adolescents, the attempt to death ratio is about 100 to 200 to 1. So what does that mean? That means for every one death by suicide, between 100 and 200 individuals will attempt suicide. So a couple thoughts here. One is that this is part of the reason why we have to focus on suicide among adolescents and those in college. It's because even though the rates don't look astronomical compared to the national average, you do have a lot of suicidal behavior. And that suicidal behavior has been shown empirically to increase suicide risk later in life. So that's the first piece. Um, the second thing to note with this attempt at death ratio, and we'll see it later on with the graphic I have, um, is part of the reason there are more deaths, thankfully, is adolescents typically use less lethal means to attempt suicide, and they also typically have lower suicide intent. So they want to end their life less during their attempt than those um, later in the lifespan. So just to give you an idea, um, with this ratio too, related to average across the lifespan on average there are about 25 attempts for every one death by suicide so you do in adolescence see a lot more attempts for every one death by suicide um, 
I guess the last piece I want to talk about with this is actually a hopeful piece, which is one of the things, one of the benefits of this ratio is while you certainly don't want individuals attempting suicide, there's a lot of room for intervention. You know, you have the odds are very much with you that the first attempt will not be a lethal attempt. And so this is not to say you don't treat the individual until later attempts, but it's to say that um, you have more room for error. If someone does attempt suicide, it's less likely to be um, deadly, and you're more likely to be able to treat the individual and help them recover than later in the lifespan. So we already covered this, but I think it's something that gets asked and I think it's important to think about. So why do we hear so much about teen suicide when the suicide rate is below average? So we talked about uh, the suicide attempts being part of that and also suicidal behavior in the teen years makes, increases your suicide risk later in life. So these are not independent time periods. What happens to you as an adolescent does affect you later. And because of that, I do think the attention that we spend on suicide is warranted. Um, I'll always argue that for any part of the lifespan. Um, my Again, my only caveat with this is that there are parts of the lifespan that get ignored. And unfortunately, these are often the parts of the lifespan that have the highest suicide rates. So you just have to watch out for that. So speaking of sui high suicide rates, the high suicide rates now actually occur for those in midlife. This is a, dr this is a drastic change. Um, it seems almost going back to the beginning of time. Um, it's really going back to about when they started keeping statistics. Um, Older adults always had the highest suicide rates. Always, always, always. Um, but about five years ago, it actually shifted so that um, adults in middle adulthood had the highest suicide rate. So what we see is suicide is the fourth leading cause of death for those 35 to 44 and 45 to 54, but it drops to the eighth leading cause of death for those 55 to 64. Now, at first glance, that may make it seem like, oh, so it's becoming less of a problem for these individuals. And that's not the case. When you look, these rates are all significantly higher than the national average. And we see the highest rate, again, in these middle adult years. So really what this is indicative of is not that the problem's getting smaller, but that you have more individuals dying of more things. So there are causes of death um, that are passing suicide, even though that doesn't mean that suicide is going down, it is going up. So again, as we see for all three of these years, they're all significantly above the 12.4 um, per 100,000 that's average. And um, I'll show you the trends on the next slide. I, th I think that's interesting to look at. Um, there are a lot of explanations on why this may happen. Some have argued it's the economy. These are from 2010, which actually are the most recent data that we have uh, from the CDC. Uh, some have argued economy. Some have argued that it's the baby boomers, and baby boomers have always had higher suicide rates, and um, it's just a continuation of that. It's probably a mixture of all these things, but it is of note, especially if um, you got a question on a quiz about, you know, when in the lifespan do you have the highest suicide rate, uh, this would be a really good option to pick. So just FYI. So let's look at trends briefly. So I actually stole this from um, John McIntosh and uh, sorry, John McIntosh and Chris Drapeau. Um, at, put together a, um, a sheet of suicide stats every year for the American Association of Suicidology. Um, and they just pull data from the CDC. And if you're curious, I'm happy to show you where all these data come from. They're all publicly accessible. But I think this is helpful to look at what's been happening with suicide over the last several years. So this is the last decade of data that we have. So it's helpful because you can look across and see the trends that are going on.
So what we see here is, like, if you look 15 to 24, it's pretty stable uh, last 10 years. Whereas, you know, you can see for 25 to 34, we recently had a bit of a peak here. And for, you know, maybe young middle adults to middle adults, we really see an entry. So look at 45 to 54, where we talked about being the highest now. If you look back in 2000, it was 14.6, whereas older adults were, you know, 19.4 for those over 85. You know, so they were significantly lower than older adults. But look at what's happened. So we've had them come up drastically over the last several years. And we've also had older adults actually trend down some, thankfully. Though they've had a little bit of a resurgence in the last year. So that's what's happened is you've actually had the older adults come down and you've really had an increase in these middle years. So I just wanted to show you these data to let you know that they are available. They're easy to get and look at and you can kind of look at what trends you're seeing um, to see where suicidal behavior is changing and um, trying to come up with explanations for why that may be. So this leads us to older adults. Um, now, while younger or while middle-aged adults now have the highest suicide rate, as we talked about, I don't want to lose focus on older adults for many reasons. Um, one is that while the overall suicide rates, thankfully for older adults, have dropped some and are lower than this, older adult men, particularly older adult white men, still have the highest suicide rates of any group. So if you look at this rate compared to older adult white men, or this is actually older adult men, not just white men, um, 47.33. This is an astronomically high suicide rate. This is twice the rate that we see in um, middle-aged adults and is four, you know, roughly four times greater than the overall national average. So I don't want to reduce the focus on older adult suicide. It's still a very important topic. And as I mentioned, there are different predictors of older adult suicide. Um, I actually have papers, I have a couple papers that I could share with you, where I do sleep and suicide research. And I have found different things depending on if I'm looking at older adults or younger adults. Suicidal behavior just is associated differently um, with psychopathology and across the lifespan. So I believe strongly older adults are important to look at. And um, this next slide is just a graph looking at the difference between men and women in suicidal behavior. Overall, we see much strong or much higher suicide rates with men than with women. And you can see how there's this leveling off for older adults, but when you look at men, or for women that is, the peak for women is actually in the middle years. But you see for men, you still have this peak at late life. Um, one thing that's important to mention, I think I've mentioned it before, um, of differences in suicidal behavior between men and women. Men overall um, are four times more likely to die by suicide than women. But women are actually three times more likely to attempt suicide than men. So with that, what we see is that men overall use um, more lethal means, and that's part of the reason why they have the higher suicide rate. So suicide in late life. So suicide in late life is not in the top 10 causes of death. Again, that's just because there are a lot more um, issues. You have a lot more people dying. So even though it's still very high in late life, um, it doesn't track the top 10 list for older adults. And again, it's older adult white men that really seem to be driving the high suicide rates. Now, if you'll recall, um, I said that the attempt to death ratio for um, younger adults was between 100 and 200 to 1. For older adults, it's between 2 and 4 to 1. So much higher likelihood that a suicide attempt will be lethal for an older adult. 
So some have argued that this is just because older adults may be more frail. But it seems to be more than this. It also seems that older adults have higher suicide intent, meaning that they want to die more, they intend to die more, and they also use more lethal means. And my old advisor at West Virginia actually made a great slide for this. Let me show you the slide. Um, so this is looking at differences between men and women of different ages with method of, um, method of suicide, or suicide attempt, I should say. And what we see is for, let's just actually look at men first, women first. What we see is that women use extremely lethal methods like firearms significantly less than men do. So, um, actually I lied, I think these are actual suicide data. So these aren't just attempts, these are actually deaths. Yeah, these are deaths. So what we see is for those who die by suicide, um, men are using firearms significantly more than women are. But interesting, too, is when you look across ages. So when you look between women, you know, younger women and older women, we see also firearm use increases significantly within women. And even within men, you can see about, what, 30% more use firearms for older adults than younger men. So we see significant changes in method of suicide, and this is likely a large reason why you see those changes with um, the lethality of suicide attempts. So the bad news with older adults is in a way there's less opportunity for intervention because the first attempt is significantly more likely to be the lethal attempt than for a younger adult. The good news is that older adults have a ton of doctor's appointments. So there's actually a lot of opportunities for intervention because older adults see their doctors a lot. So what's interesting is that when comparing suicide attempters to non-attempters for older adults, um, the attempters were more likely to visit their general practitioner within two weeks of their suicide attempt. And we know from the literature that up to 75% of older adults who died by suicide saw a physician within a month of their death. Um, now, with this, there are limitations. Uh, yeah, I feel bad for primary care physicians because they have they're trying to see a bunch of people. They have to see a bunch of people. So you may have four or five minutes with a client, with a patient, and you're trying to, you know, check off all these things to make sure they're doing okay. And um, you just don't have enough time. So there's this this opportunity that we know that within a month, 75% of those who attempt suicide, or who died by suicide, rather, saw their primary care physician. But only 4% were diagnosed before their suicide attempt, whereas 57% were diagnosed after. So what does this tell you? Well, to me, this tells me that the physicians just don't have enough time to assess for suicide and to assess for mood disorder even. And because of that, they it's just not on the radar. They, you know, suicidal individuals are presenting to the doctor. The doctor just doesn't have time to assess and treat them. So one of the greatest potentials for um, intervention for improving in this field is trying to improve our ability to recognize mental health disorders in primary care, uh, because we know that's where older adults especially will present. And um, the opportunities there, they're coming to the doctor. Um, we just have to improve our ability to recognize that while also recognizing that primary care physicians have extremely, um, have a really tough job. They have to see a ton of people um, and have very little time to do it. So it's one of the places we have for growth. And I want to talk, I just want to finish up with talking a little bit about beliefs about aging. And, um, this um, this quote I have here is actually from a suicide textbook that I used to use. It's the Maris um, um, textbook of suicidology. And they say, 
Once the quality of one's life has long since peaked and is fraught with physical and emotional pain, the wish to end one's, end one's life is somewhat understandable. I disagree. Um, now, granted, I'm I'm a Jera person. I was trained in Jera psychology. Um, I specialize in older adults. I did an internship specializing in older adults, and this is a myth that a lot of people believe. A lot of people think, you know, if I was older, if I was going through the things that, you know, Jim is going through, I would be depressed too, or I'd be suicidal too. And what we miss is that these feelings are not typical for older adults. Believe it or not, older adults have less depression than earlier in the lifespan. You're more likely as a um, adolescent or as a young adult to be depressed than an older adult. So people will write off depression in an older adult and say, oh, that's normal. If I had to, you know, if I was Jim, I'd be depressed too. Well, statistically, that's not true. Um, and late life depression is still treatable and should be treated. Um, the highest life satisfaction across the entire lifespan is for older adults. The average older adult's very happy. They enjoy their life. So if you have an older adult who doesn't enjoy their life, that's not normal. That's a need for intervention. And lastly, you know, there is physical and emotional train or pain in late life, but much of that is treatable. Um, so we don't want to just write off um, suicidal thoughts or um, attempts or any of this um, and say, well, it's understandable. It's not. It's not. Older adults are happy people. They're less depressed people. Um, and if they're not, if they're suffering, that's an, there's a need for intervention there. It's not something to be ignored. So I want to leave you with that. Just um, dig into those older adult readings. I think you'll think I think you'll find them interesting. But what you'll see is that suicide in older adults is just different. Um, it's different than other parts of the lifespan. But it's so important because we do have those older adult men with very high suicide rates, and we we still just don't fully understand how to prevent that, how to help them. So there's a great need for work in this area, and hopefully convince some of you that it's um, it's a really good place to be. It's where I do most of my research, um, well, not, a fair amount of my research, and um, it's really a needed area.